you know, in May of 2011, um, I was walking across a stage, beautiful stage in Queens, and my family was in the audience, friends, uh, my girlfriend, and my professors, and it was one of the most memorable events of my life. I was graduating law school. You know, and for me, I think at that moment, I realized, reflecting on my life, that here I was, a Brooklyn kid, you know, who grew up in Sheepshead Bay and just wanted to do something more, was finally becoming a lawyer. And as I was walking to the stage to get hooded with the official ceremony to be a lawyer, you know, I was, I was excited. You know, I was excited, I was looking at my family, people were clapping, and it was an amazing moment. It was exhilarating. But at the same time, reality hit. You know, I was finishing walking and about to go down when you're graduating, and reality hit. Just like, like cold water just being splashed into, like, into your face. And I realized that as I was watching, you know, this amazing event, and I remember about the American flag. I remember that that flag means also that I cannot vote. It means that I have no citizenship. And it also means that that flag can deport me because of my immigration status. But at the same time, it means much more than that. It is my home. It is the place that has seen me grow. And it embodies what it means to be an American. And I was walking back to you know, my seat and I realized that the fact that I have no immigration status does not define me. It took three years to graduate and another, another tormenting few more months for the bar exam, which was the most horrible experience ever, but necessary. You know, I realized that, you know what? I may not be a lawyer now, licensed lawyer, but you may need a license to practice law, to appear before a judge, to take clients, but you don't need a license to fight for your family. You don't need a license to fight for your community. And I remember graduating and you know, after that, I was like, what am I gonna do next? I had no legal work authorization. I, had, I didn't know whether I was actually gonna be admitted and be a lawyer. Well, what's next? I remember graduating uh, also in, when, in the philosophy department and I guess kind of realizing the same question. Not only that I didn't have a, a work authorization or I couldn't work, but I had a philosophy degree. And for one point, I really realized, I tr truly believe in myself, you know what? I'm gonna walk around the streets just talking to people and talk about philosophy. That's a good, good career choice, why not? But it gave me a path forward. St. Francis has given me a, a solid pillar in which I have based my, my life and has based my advocacy. Because I realized that in St. Francis I did learn not just about, about Socrates, not just about Aristotle, Heidegger, and you name it, you know, the, the, the classicals and the modern philosophers, but I did realize that that there's much more to their words. And Professor, I remember actually walking to Professor Berman's office, I think in my, my senior year, and, and, her, and talking with her, and I asked her, and I told her actually, and said, you know what, Professor? I came into St. Francis majoring, with the hopes of majoring in e-commerce. Had no clue what that was neither. But I, you know, I ended up with a philosophy degree. And it has been more than an academic experience. And she said, exactly. 
And I, there's also another a, a, a great professor, uh, Dr. Bolin, who I remember also kind of having a similar conversation with her and saying, you know, uh, what am I going to do with a philosophy degree? And she also said something amazing, too, that I think is something very strong for so many young people is do what you love doing and the money will come. Simply saying, in other words, that when, you, when, you're, when you, your soul gravitates to your passions, anything's possible. And for me, realizing that at five years old, coming to this country, at the hand of my mother, I would not have expected where I am now. But I do look back because I remember, you know, just the probing lights flashing across the landscape in the desert. I remember cactus. I remember dirt. I remember the darkness. But looking back, I do remember that my mom was holding my hand very tightly. And at that point, I realized I can only imagine what my mom was feeling at that moment. Four little children with two strangers, coyotes. These are the people who help immigrants across the U.S.-Mexico border. Anything could have happened that moment. Anything could have happened. She could have been killed. She could have been raped. Her kids could have been kidnapped. But her courage was so ardent to risk her own life for her family. And we always talk about the, the dreamers, the young people who came to, to the U.S. Uh, to no fault their own. And, you know, the dreamers are cool, are good, because, you know, they came here, they're here, they're speaking English, they do, they're going to school. But you know what? It, is, it implies that the parents are at fault. But I, what I can tell you this right now is that I would never blame my mother for risking her life to give me a better life. And these dangers are not abstract. These dangers are not something that we just talk about in the news. I don't know if you all seen uh, about a few, last summer, the, there was a, a crisis of refugee children crossing the U.S.-Mexico border from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. These are children, 14, 13, 10 years old, crossing the border by themselves. And many of them were young girls. And they interviewed one little girl and they said, you know what? Many of us are already prepared to be raped on the way here. So for me to look at my mom and say, Mom, thank you for bringing me here, but you know, you're at fault. I got here where I am now, not because of Caesar going to school, Caesar getting this grade, Caesar graduating law school. I got here because of my family. I got here because of my community and the administrators and the professors who believed in me. And I will never turn my back on the community that has seen me grow. And through all this effort, we have accomplished much. I was able to graduate law school, but I was also able to uh, start a national organization to bring other students, undocumented or not, to fight for immigration reform, to fight for a better policy that will protect our families that will cut through the politics and the drama that goes on in Washington, D.C. and across the country and focus on our priority, which is our families. But at the same time, here in New York City, in New York State, made unprecedented news when it found that New York would allow undocumented students or undocumented lawyers the privilege to practice law. And that means a lot because if there's a quote in the, in the actual decision that says, for me, it, that is the American dream. It says, no matter what your immigration status, no matter where you come from, that has no bearing on your character to practice law. What matters is your zealous advocacy for your client, and that's it. You know, I did everything that was required of me. I got up at six in the morning, commuting from Staten Island, the South Shore, all the way to Flushing, Queens. It was almost like a five, six hour commute each day. Taking the bus, the S62, to the ferry, to the E-train, to another bus, and walking there. And I did that for three years. And 
and I loved it. You know, as a New Yorker, I loved it. You know, I, I tell my story in other, in other states, and they say, oh, poor, you know, Cesar, I'm so sorry. I, you know, we're New Yorkers, you know, we're used to this. We're like, all right, we'll go here, we'll go there. So for me, it was I study, I did everything that, that I needed to do for my classes. I didn't read, I didn't do my homework when I, I, when I needed to do it. I know, I know. But I was prepared, you know, six hours gave me a, three hours gave me a great time to read all my work. So I was prepared, professor, so. But, you know, it's, I think New York established something unprecedented. Now, I tell my story for three main purposes. One, because through our stories, we challenge the narrative of the others, the us versus them. We see it very clearly in the news, in Fox News. I was actually in, in Laura Ingraham's uh, TV show on, on Fox. And as you can imagine, you know, it's Fox News. So, but you know, when I told her my story, and this is really actually fact, I told her my story and after the interview, she was like, Caesar, great entertainment. So, you know, they know a lot of the stuff that they don't believe, but it touched, you know, it touched her, my story touched her. And stories are so powerful because not only do they change minds, they change hearts. I can give you here a whole statistics of why immigration reform, why education reform, why criminal justice reform is so important. But without the stories, it's a world with no color. Our stories are what connects each other to our lives. And stories are so powerful because they can literally make the difference between people supporting your cause or people opposing your cause. And what I have found out in Washington, D.C. and across the state capitals that there's going to be people who truly are going to be opposed to what you believe in. You like puppies? Great. Some people don't like puppies. That is, you know, it really happens. But stories are amazing. Now people say, well, how, how, you know, just give us an example. You know, why are, you know, I can tell my stories, but is it really going to change? There was a U.S. senator from Alaska, Lisa Murkowski, when in 2010, we were actually fighting and pushing for the DREAM Act. There's federal legislation that would put uh, a path to citizenship for dreamers like myself. Now Alaska, right? Last place you would think there's a lot of immigrants. And there isn't a lot of immigrants out there. But she met, her daughter met a dreamer in school. And she learned and listened to her story. And that was enough for a Republican senator from Alaska to vote yes for the DREAM Act. If that can change, if, a, if that story can change a U.S. senator, our stories can do much more. Now second, I tell my story because I do tell, I do want to let young people know that there's always a fighting chance. And as I mentioned that I, I have accomplished everything that I have accomplished, not because of Caesar, not because like Caesar was awesome and cool, go for it. I owe everything that I have and everything that I have accomplished and everything that I will accomplish through my fam because of my family, because of professors like Professor Berman and St. Francis College and my community that's helped me continue my legal profession, helped me my, on my advocacy. And I do believe that when life puts a wall and, or obstacle in, in your life, it's not really just to stop you. It is meant to guide you to where you need to be. And I remember so many times where I, have, I was graduating from St. Francis College, and yeah, like, what's next for me? I have no work, stat, no work authorization. I went to work back in a restaurant as a, as a waiter. And I, I, you know, I, I felt that that was an obstacle. I felt that you know, I have a law degree, I have a philosophy degree. You know, why, why am I, what am I still doing here? I graduated college, uh, law school, and same thing. I'm a lawyer. W what am I doing in a restaurant? And you know, I realized that, that because of those experiences, they guided me to where I am now. What I have seen is that when you're a lawyer, and I'm glad actually that at that time that I wasn't licensed because you know, my mother, you know, she always says, Caesar, oh, she always, she's always bragging to all her friends and family and everybody. She's like, you know, mi es un abogado, él es puede tomar su caso. My son's a lawyer, he can take your cases. I'm like, mom, 
don't get me in trouble. I'm not a lawyer yet. Don't get me this bar before I even get barred. And it's so funny because at that time, she, and, and now she's like, you know, talk, talk, you know, talk to these people. But when I was a philosophy major, I used to talk about Socrates, I used to talk about ideals, I used to talk about this, and they used to say, Cesar, just shut up. <laughs> so it's, it's so funny, those two dualities at that point. So finally, the, three, the main point that I, I tell my story is, we are here in this world, not just for ourselves. And I learned that lesson because my mom risked everything for me and her family. And philosophy, whatever profession that many people are here for, means nothing if your efforts are not meant to improve the human condition. And it starts simply with your life, with your family, your community, and your country. And I do see the American flag as, you know, as sometimes a contradiction, but it is my home. I do believe that when we are challenging our elected officials, we challenge them because our priorities are our family and our community. I have confronted Hillary Clinton, I have confronted Donald Trump, I have confronted so many other elected officials, including I was actually arrested in Iowa because I was confronting uh, Donald Trump, Sarah Palin, you name it, the works. And you know, for me, you know, they, they said that I was challenged, I was trespassing, but all I was doing is, is challenging and giving voice to my First Amendment. And I, you know, I challenged that in court. Obviously, I lost, I was in Iowa. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't regret where I, am, where I was. I don't regret fighting for my family. Because at the end, I'm not fighting for a political party. I'm not fighting for Democrats. I'm not fighting for Republicans. I'm fighting for my family. And as we see the fight for immigration reform, we see the fight for so many policy changes that are facing our country, we need to be reminded that it starts not just with us, but it starts with staying true to the people that we love. It's easy to get caught up in the fanfare of President Obama, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, but we must be very careful when it comes to politicians or elected officials. And to understand what democracy is. You know, sometimes people, you know, the easiest thing, the hardest thing has been in doing our advocacy in Washington, C, and across the country, has been challenging our political allies. It's easy when, you know, when I actually got arrested challenging the elected officials, the Republicans, people were like, great job, Cesar, great job, you're, you're to stand up to Donald Trump. But when it came to challenging President Obama to push for executive action to protect our families, they were all saying, why are you attacking your ally? Go after Republicans. You know, they are, they're the ones who are opposed to immigration reform. They're the ones who are blocking immigration reform. They're the ones who are trying to deport your families. But we responded, well, we are also going after, you know, we're also holding accountable Republicans, but we're also going to hold accountable our allies. Because at the end of the day, President Obama is still the president of the United States and he has the power right now. And you know what? Our ally is actually the one deporting our families. From 1893 to 1997, the US deported approximately 2.1 million people. President Obama did that in six years. And that was supposed to be our ally. And I support the president, I campaigned for him in 2008, 2012, but you know what? My, my loyalty was with my family and my community, not an elected official. My job was not, go, not, not to be friends with anyone in Washington, D.C., attend the galas, and be invited to the White House. My job was to make sure that, that, that I had an education, that students like me had an education, that my mom would not be deported from, from this country and never see her grandchildren or her family ever again. That was my priority. And it started with significant power that young people, like many people in this room, have. And it starts simply with this. Social media. You know, there's always that cynicism that young people don't turn out to vote. People, young people have no voice. But you know what? We all have social media, and I do tell you this, that elected officials are paying attention to what you all are, are thinking. They may make it, they may mask it as they don't care, but they are paying attention. Actually, uh, just to show you how, how powerful a uh, small tweet can be, uh, I remember writing an article uh, and publishing it on on how you, the Texas U.S. Senator John Cornyn was opposing immigration reform. I wrote it, 
and I tweeted at him, not thinking I was going to get a response. And John Cornett, U.S. Senator from Texas, responded saying, complete BS to my article. Not very senatorial, but it shows that it got to him. He defended himself. He responded to my article saying, well, I haven't done this. You know, I, this, is, this is why I'm doing immigration reform. But you know, there I was, you know, my phone. It's, uh, with, I don't know if many of you have found the Black Lives Matter movement, but this is similar young people who have taken their phones and have challenged the media and have challenged elected officials to pay attention to them. And you don't need, you know, you don't need millions of dollars to affect policy change. People say, Cesar, how did you start your organization? You, you all are really well organized. You guys have meetings with the White House. You meet with Senate, the President. You meet with this member of Congress. You have met with Governor Cuomo. You know, how did you guys do it? I had no clue. I had no clue. And I think that's also gave me the kind of like the philosophy background that I was going to bring order to my chaos. I didn't know the rules of the game. When President Obama in 2012 and his White House lawyers said, Caesar and you dreamers, the president does not have the power to protect dreamers. He doesn't have the legal authority. You know, there's a top lawyers from across the country, top lawyers from the White House, from you name it. And there we were, me, you know, still a law student. And we said, you know what? You're wrong. Because we have done our research. We have talked to other experts. And, the, and presidents since Dwight Eisenhower have taken executive action. Republican and Democrats have taken executive action on immigration. So don't tell us that you cannot do this because you can. And in 2012, through the effort of so many people, the president took a historic action to protect dreamers. And it was literally done by students like you. So we can make a difference. We can change this country. And for me, I don't have a vote, but I do have a voice. And that voice is through you. I refuse to give up on this country. To believe that this country is done, I, believe, I refuse to believe that that country is going to deport me because we have seen this story countless times. First, it was the Germans, the Italians, the Irish. Now it's, you know, Latinos but we have defeated those forces. You know, people used to call us, people right now, you know, still, you know, we have been in rallies where people are literally punching us, you know, and we're confronting them. But we do that because that is the tradition of being an American, confronting power for our communities. And simply I will close with just the fact that my main objective here and my objective in the next few months is that I cannot wait to be licensed and actually in the second department a few blocks from here with my mother standing next to me and me telling her, Mom, your son's a lawyer now. Everything that she has done, everything that I have done has been to bring, to bring that moment into fruition. And just reflecting actually, just, you know, I was actually telling Professor Berman and that I remember from being told in high school that I couldn't go to college because of my undocumented status. My guidance counselor said, you know what? Yeah, you, you, you're illegal, you can't go to college. Go to work. You know, at, at 16, 17 years old, my world crumbled. But, you know, from that moment to this moment now, and it has not been public yet, but I was actually invited by Senator Sanders to join his campaign in his senior leadership team to fight for immigration reform. So from someone with no papers to potentially changing the direction of this nation, philosophy never ends. And there is always, always purpose. You just need to bring order to your chaos and bring direction to your life. Thank you so much. You know, when I actually first went to Washington DC and I told my story, yeah, the consequences were real. You know, we have seen that, you know, we were seeing people being deported. But we also realized one thing, that when you're in the shadows, it's much easier for, for people to not know who you are, to be a faceless number in a deportation statistic. But when it comes to 
telling your story, including my story, the story of my family, it's much more difficult to round up a whole family, round up Caesar, round up someone, and, and, and actually and deport them. And we actually have been, the, um, one of our parts of our advocacy was stopping the deportations of young people, of students, because you know, we, that was, it was happening, but people didn't know about that. When we actually told the stories of, of, of for example, a, a student, Eric Valdez from Harvard University, who was on his way to a plane to go back to school, and immigration stopped him, and they, were, they placed him in deportation proceedings. It would, have, it, would have, it would have happened. He would have been expelled from the country he only knows, and he would have left his biochemical engineering in Harvard, like his education. But we told the story of him. We told him, this is Eric Valdez from Harvard. This is someone who wants to contribute to cancer research. This is someone who wants to contribute to this country. Are you really gonna deport this person? And it worked. You know, we, we, it worked. We, we through stepping out of the shadows, gave us a face, and you know, I remember when I publicly came out. Then, you know, for me, a, a New York Times article came out in 2010, and you know, saying yeah, this is you know, this is someone who is, and I was afraid because everyone knew now, and and I went back to class, and everyone was like, like man, I didn't know about this. Like, well, I didn't care, but you know, I, you're still my friend, and you know, I we're going to continue to fight with you, and that was such an amazing experience because through telling your stories, we're able to humanize an issue rather than just becoming a number. Well, first of all, it's you, he's, he already has an amazing friend who is willing to you know, just be with him. So I think that's an amazing step. Second of all, there's, you know, versus 2001 and 2000, 2015, there is many resources. So one definitely talked to, one talked to his guidance counselor, administration. And second of all, there's tons of resources online um, but also, um, you know, I can also provide you my contact info, and if he has any questions, you know, we can, I can definitely connect. Like, I also just don't want to be here and, and talk and just say bye. I want to be able to be connected with you all. So, like, um, I won't give you my campaign email because that's just for the campaign, but I'll give you my personal email uh, that, you know, he can connect. But there's tons of resources, and again, he has a friend already there, and that's a big step. The other, hopefully, moment that I do get to experience is, you know, not only my swearing-in ceremony, but the moment where I'm actually sworn in as a U.S. citizen. When that will come, I don't know. Um, you know, some people have said, you know, just get married. But one, I don't want to get married. That's first of all. <laughs> Second of all, um, you know, it's, I also, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to do it that way, right? I want to earn it. I want to, I want it to be something that comes from the effort of, of myself and of the people that we have fought for. So. I hope one day that I do become a citizen and you know, hold my natural ceremony uh, certificate in my office. Um, but at the same time, I, uh, I'm an American. You know, I, that does not, the fact that I don't have a citizen does not define me and it shouldn't define us. Just the fact that we don't have millions of dollars uh, to pay lobbyists doesn't mean that we don't have power, because we do. And it really starts with our vote and it starts with ourselves and through our social media that has captured the attention of a, of a, you know, we're changing laws, we're changing minds and nations based on social media. Yes, you know, actually there's, um, we have, um, uh, there was another, uh, his name is Jose Antonio Vargas, not related, uh, he's Filipino. Um, he actually created an organization called Define American to actually look into the stories of undocumented and not just preaching to the choir, right? Just, but actually going into communities in Iowa, in Alabama, he's done that. And I think it's very powerful because his story is even more powerful because he was, he, wa he, he had a great successful story. He was, uh, actually two of them, two of the founders there. One of them was, he was a extraordinary New York Times editor, uh, reporter. He had interviewed Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he actually came out publicly as undocumented in a New York Times magazine article. And he told his story and he said that we need to change the narrative from them by telling our stories through people who may not agree with us. And most of the time, people are gonna be completely opposed to you, no matter what, but majority of people are gonna be people who are just, need to learn about the issue and need to be, you know, need to learn the stories about the community. Uh, and then there's uh, Julissa Arce, who also is part of the Define American uh, and defineamerican.org. And she was also another a compelling story. She was 
uh, Goldman Sachs star. You know, working in Wall Street, she was, you know, obviously making really great money, uh, but she was undocumented at that time. And she also came out publicly telling her story. And uh, I, I think the CEO of, of Goldman Sachs, you know, spoke to her and said, you know what, I didn't understand, I didn't know about this issue. And this issue obviously is much more complex than I thought. And, you know, I'm gonna support immigration reform. And, you know, obviously it has been a whole effort, but it's through those stories that we connect to people who may not know about the issue. And, and it simply, I think it just simply starts with stories. And I think it could be definitely from a very organized well campaign to just simply going to your friends, this is my story. And it's not just on immigration, it's on so many issues that we have confront, that this nation confronts. Well, one, my mom always used to say, in la familia tenemos que tener un abogado y un doctor. In our family, <laughs> we need to have a lawyer or a doctor. And, you know, you know, for us, you know, she always believed that we need to have someone to defend our family, defend the community. Uh, so for me, I think that was a logical extension of philosophy to law. Um, but I do think that for me, philosophy, you know, I would say major in it, just simply major. It, it's really, you get to see the world in a way that you have never thought. Like, if you if you ever seen a, a leaf in a micro uh, microscope and you see like the, you know, the, you know, the cells and everything, that's how philosophy is. Like, it was through, it's through my philosophy education that I was able to see how laws not only have an impact in you, but how laws are part of a narrative that's based on stories, that's based on the interaction of people. So for me, it's simply, and one is simply, it was cool to go around the country and just like challenge politicians. That was also cool too. Um, but I think philosophy definitely opened my, my ability to see the world in a whole different way. And you know, I cannot really tell you how it feels, but when you're there, you will, see, you will see that, as I told Professor Berman, like philosophy is much more than an academic experience. And you know, for me, immigration reform is something that obviously is very personal because it affects me. I wanna be a citizen, but I wanna make sure that the face of this nation is not, is not represented, the story or the face is not represented by Donald Trump. I want this, the face and story of the United States to be represented by people like you by people like us. You know, a nation that's strong, but a nation that's diverse, and a nation that's gonna be welcoming, not, not fearful. Right now. Well, we, you know, we have seen this before, right? Especially when it comes to tough economic times, it's, it's easy to blame someone, and it's easy to scape group, scapegoat a group. You know, we have seen that with, with the Germans, the Italians, uh, you know, Irish used to, you know, they used to be you know, and even in, in, in Boston, I actually just came from Boston uh, two days ago, and there's over 60,000 undocumented Irish people. And it's easy to just see one face as immigration is a Latino issue. We see just Mexicans, we just see people from Central America. But it's a, it's a much more complex issue. You know, you don't see that. You don't see the fact that there is Irish, Italian, uh, Israeli, Canadian immig undocumented immigrants all over the country. And it's much more complex, but it's, it's insecurity, it's fear. And unfortunately, we do have elected officials who demagogue an issue just for the sake of their own political standing. But you know, we're better than that. I do believe that we're better than that as a nation. I have seen it with my own, with my own eyes. I have heard the stories of people. I went to Iowa uh, in a small town represented by a congressman, one of the most uh, uh, kind of like pretty much anti-immigrant member of Congress, Congressman Steve King, and I remember speaking to his constituency, uh, an actual uh, a, a priest and uh, a family who said, you know, Caesar, Congressman King does not represent me. And this is not who we are as a nation. And this is a congressman who has won by large margin over 20 points, his victory margins, to winning now by three or four points. So, you know, it is, our nation can overcome fear, can overcome insecurity, but also acknowledging that yes, you know, people are concerned about their jobs. People are concerned about their families. And you know, for me to say, hey, don't worry about that, just pass immigration form. Absolutely not. We, uh, just as they're listening to my story, we listen to their stories. And that's how we connect and that's how we bring consensus to a complicated issue like immigration reform. It seems like there is, like, like there is a big current of opposition 
but it's just a very small but very vocal and loud group. We have, like for us, we have gotten the support from amazing and unlikely allies, including, for example, the Indian nations uh, in Arizona. For example, in Arizona, when Arizona passed an, uh, a legislation, an anti-immigrant law, SB 1070, that said that police can check your papers if they believe that you look undocumented. And, and the Indian nation there, uh, the Navajo and other in Arizona and across the country said, you know what, we're not going to enforce that law in our in our uh, in our land, everyone's welcome here. We have worked with you know with like again Korean African American. We're working with Black Lives Matter movement because immigration reform is not just about uh, providing paths to citizenship. It's also it's also uh, ensuring that we have a criminal justice system that's not that does not target communities of color. So you know there is much more support than it seems. It's just that it's easy. It's much it's much easier to scare people. Than to, than to really bring people to let them know about, about an issue that needs to be fixed. And it's hard, it's de very difficult. And you know, the statistics are out there, the numbers are out there, but you know, that's why I think I am a firm believer of, of stories because stories do provide an impact that statistics on their own do not provide. I, we have seen like literally people from, from Alabama, from Georgia, and this, are like, this is not New York City, this is uh, the middle of Tennessee, this is the middle of Heartland, South Carolina. You know, for us talking to people, telling our stories, ensuring that people in those communities stand up and say, look, I'm your neighbor in, in a small town of, of uh, Birmingham. So, you know, it simply starts with that and we have gotten, like, there is, there's very small, like, again, it's, it's, it really does seem like there's a much bigger opposition but there isn't. It's and it's through simply telling our stories and through simply and organizing as well. Yes, there there is definitely a structure that we have through the Dream Action Coalition. We have coordinated conferences. We have coordinated uh, actions uh, to press conferences to connect dreamers and students and allies with with the community to make sure that we are doing, for example, public. Uh, coming out events uh, in 2010, something that we did across the country in Chicago, in LA, in New York City, you name it. We, you know, many of us got together and publicly said, I'm undocumented and I'm a, an unafraid. I am Cesar Vargas and I am a Brooklyn kid. And we replicated that effort, coordinated effort across the country to tell people who, they, who we were. And it, it, you know, it has definitely changed the narrative uh, to, to what people think about. Right now, everyone, like, everyone loves, quote, unquote, loves dreamers, right? We hear Hillary Clinton talk about it. We hear President Barack Obama talk about it. We hear everyone talk about it. But it was first, you know, before, before this, it was, you know, everyone needs to get out of this country. It's, it's those people, it's they, they. It's us versus them. But now, you know, everyone's like, okay, even President Joe Kennedy, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, even Donald Trump has said, okay, you know, let's deal with the kids. But, you know, we didn't get there without us telling our stories. And we are obviously have a lot of work to do, but we're going to continue to tell the stories, not only of, of the dreamers, but of our parents, of the new refugee children who are literally escaping death. Like, like 10 year old kids. Like, there's a documentary, oh man, I forgot. There's a documentary of this, of the refugee children. And it's so powerful. You get to see literally 10-year-old kids on a train from Central America, from El Salvador, Guatemala, crossing whole from to the U.S. on a train by themselves. And there was actually an interview with, with this little 10-year-old kid and said, you know what, I, I want to the, I wanna go to the U.S. because I'm afraid of dying and I can't wait to to uh, a nice American family can give me toys, can give me shoes, can give me, can give me happiness. And you know, these are the stories, you know, it's, it, it's happening. And we're, and we're not seeing just this in, in the U.S. This is something that's happening globally. In Syria, you know, we're seeing the Syrian refugees and we saw the very tragic picture of the little kid, little baby, you know, washing up in the, in the, in the sea. You know, this is something that's happening. These are the stories and I think the Pope did an extraordinary job to f focus. You know, he wasn't here preaching about policy or 80% of this, 60% of this. Simply just li look at their faces, listen to their stories.